Okay, welcome to Meet the Candidate. I'm Vernon Garrison. Today we have with us James L. Carr Jr., uh, who is running for the North Carolina U.S. Senate seat to replace the retiring Richard Burke. Welcome sure. to the show, Mr. James L. Carr Jr. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Outstanding. Well, my first question to you, uh, sir, is what do you believe are the responsibilities of a representative? I think that a representative has two primary responsibilities. The first is to address the current issues that we're experiencing, and the next is to prepare us for the future. And I think that those are the core responsibilities, and I think um, clearly we're kind of falling short in that area from a representative perspective. And so kind of thinking through from my own perspective, what I think, like I said, the most important responsibilities are is to just, again, focus on what, what are our current issues that we need to address. And again, but not at the expense of tomorrow's opportunities. So, Understood. Understood. Now, another question would be, why do you believe it's important for a representative to trust in people? I think the main reason is, and I think one of the things that representatives sometimes forget is that the majority of people in the district will not have voted for you. So even if you have a high turnout in the district, uh, 50%, you may get over 50% of the people who actually voted, but that doesn't mean that you got 50% of the people that live in that district or that county or that state. And so it's important to understand that you're representing everyone in that state. And in order to, uh, to bridge, in order to, to build trust to get things done, everyone really has to have a has to know that you trust them that you believe in them because even if they didn't vote for you you still represent that district and so i think that's why it's so important that as a representative that you build trust with people so that you can actually create the win-win situation that we need in order to get things done okay great now this question right here i'd like for you to go in depth uh, you have a, a very very impressive uh, thought process from that's coming from me personally but what is your governing philosophy give us a take us to school on that i think that uh, the one thing that we have in common is our own desire for personal liberty and i think a lot of times we try we're trying to unite around things that we can't unite around but the one thing we can unite around is personal freedom and so my governing philosophy is to empower people towards that goal of of achieving their dreams and their aspirations in life. So the things that I think that I would advocate for personally are the things that lead to personal freedom, the things that actually help you to, whatever your dreams or your aspirations, whatever your goals are, you can achieve those. And I think if we, by approaching it in that manner, we can get rid of some of the division that we're seeing in our country. It's just to remember that the only thing that we really have in common is our is personal liberty for ourselves. Okay, okay. Now, how does your philosophy translate into policy? Help us with that. So, so I think there are four pillars to the policies that I'm advocating for. Uh, the first one is privacy rights. And I think one of the things that I think at some point we have to do is end the culture wars. And I think that we we keep, we've been arguing over certain issues for over 50 years. And it looks like the way things are going, we'll be arguing over for another 50 years. So to me, the first thing we need to do is to establish once and for all um, that we have a right to our own bodies, that we have the right to love who we want to love, and we have the right to self-defense, that that in, in essence, we own ourselves. And we actually, we know we live in a community, but we still have rights as individuals that we that we have that have to be respected. So that's number one is taking arguments over rights off the table. The next thing would be infrastructure investments. I think that's a big one because when when I think about a lot of the issues that we're facing in the state, a lot of it just boils down to infrastructure. And to me, infrastructure is how do we move goods and services and information from point A to point B. And I think when you're seeing like housing issues in urban areas, lack of capital in rural areas that gap can be bridged with infrastructure. I know, um, you know, especially in some of the rural areas, one of the problems along with capital, a lack of capital investment is when we look at our young people and sort of the brain drain that occurs and thinking that, you know, if we can basically encourage entrepreneurship, encourage that you don't have to necessarily leave an area in order to experience basically the, the beauty of our state, 
then I think we can, again, just through simple infrastructure investments, we can sort of basically knock out two birds with one stone, essentially. Um, and then the third pillar that I want to look at is modernizing our educational system. Um, one of the things that I see with, from an educational standpoint is that kids are not ready to hit the ground running at 18. I know for me, when I graduated from high school, it was military college or work, working in a factory. Um, uh, I decided to go the military route and then I went to college later. But I think for a lot of young people, in some, in some respects, we have, they have too many options. And so I think for, with parents and teachers and, this, and the scholars themselves sitting down and, and going through what exactly do you want to do with your life? And not necessarily what you want to do with your life, but where do you want your journey to start? Because you, you, you can have a lot of different options through life. But I think for kids, it's helping them start somewhere so that when they turn 18, they're ready to hit the road. So my belief would be that um, when you get to the 10th grade, no later than the 10th grade, we start preparing the, the child, the, the scholar for the journey that they want to go on. So if you want to go to college, there's a separate, there's a path you're on. If you want to go to work, there's a path you're on. And so we we allow kids, so you know, so something like work wise, that would be like a work study, internships, apprenticeships. Uh, college would be um, preparing for fine understanding your financial options, your financing options, understanding going to community college to get certain courses out of the way to, to lower the cost of college. So I think it's, again, from a modernizing our educational system is getting kids prepared to hit the road running, hit the ground running at 18. And then the last pillar is, and this is a big one for me, is decoupling benefits from work. Currently, we our healthcare system is skewed because we have essentially two pools of workers, of well, people who need insurance coverage. We have one pool that works in a corporate environment, another pool that doesn't. The pool that works in a corporate environment is the least risky pool for insurance companies. So that pool gets the best rates, but the other pool doesn't get particularly good rates. So when we're looking at trying to deal with healthcare issues, we can't because we have a skewed system. So to me, I want to decouple that relationship. That's one of the reasons, but the other reason is just to encourage entrepreneurship and job mobility. We shouldn't have to work to get good benefits. And so if we can decouple that relationship, and that's going to be mean expanding Medicare, that's going to mean private type, well, moving people away from employee-based insurance. But there are ways that we can do that that's not government-run health insurance. It would still be private-run insurance. It would be along the model of what the car auto and did auto industry does today from an insurance perspective. So, you know, we get our car insurance from a private provider with state and federal oversight. And that's essentially what healthcare could be. And so those would be how I would translate my philosophy into action. Let me ask you a question about one of the the four, if you, you're calling them pillars, the, the four things that you believe in that are featured on your website and one of them is uh, a very unique position concerning entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. business-wise, in international business and or in local businesses doing international business, joining that marketplace. Mm -hmm. That's something pretty huge. Could you elaborate that on that? Yeah, I think that the world really isn't that large anymore. I think um, so. I went overseas in '85, part of the Air Force, and I remember going to England. And since I'm from Lexington, North Carolina. I wanted some barbecue. And I remember going into the place on the base, a little restaurant, and they had barbecue. And I went in, I was excited, and it was red, it was ketchup-based barbecue, not vinegar-based barbecue, not real barbecue. So <laughs> I was definitely disappointed. But okay. Just from that experience, kind of realizing that, you know, there is a market around the world for the items that we have in our country. And I know that a lot of people, even through Amazon and other large vendors, they actually, there are people who sell products on Amazon who actually get those products from overseas to sell on Amazon. So th the market is there two ways. I think, you know, when I think about what does North Carolina have to offer, uh, we have, uh, one of the things, I, I look at pig farming, I look at pork. You know, you look at Asian markets, especially love pork. There is an opportunity in Asian markets to sell pork. And I think just kind of opening up our minds to what is feasible that if someone likes a product in the United States, there's a good chance they like it overseas too. We're not different. Um, and I think that's what I was trying to get at in terms of how we can look at products that are produced in the state, 
how we can sell those products across the state, but also across the world in general. Okay. And I recall reading some things about making housing more affordable, mm -hmm. specifically, and you may have touched on this already, but how do you feel that your position as a U.S. Senator would put you in a position of uh, influence to do such a thing? I think, you know, one of the things I've I think for elected representatives is that you're leaders in the community. So sometimes it's not just, uh, you know, trying to pass legislation. Sometimes it's just advocating a position and allowing something within the community to take care of that issue. Now, what I specifically can do from a housing perspective is, that, you know, when I think about urban areas, one of the reasons that housing is so expensive because people want to live in urban areas. And so, one of, and one of the reasons is because I want to live close because there's not infrastructure to get me into the city. And so I have to live in the city as opposed to living outside of the city and being able to commute into the city, even for work or for pleasure. And, you know, having been up in uh, New York quite a bit, um, had a friend that lived in Jersey City, where it's pretty cool to be able to get on the path going to New York City, have fun in New York City, be able to go around the city and then come back to little old New Jersey. Uh, and that's what I mean by, you know, so, you know, kind of think about the cost, the, the, the housing cost difference between New York and New Jersey is astronomical. And that's, and you have that same problem here and we can still fix, we can fix the issue by just better public transit that allows people to commute into the city for whatever reason, but still live outside of the city. And that's what I mean too about people, if we get people living outside the city, that brings capital into rural areas as well. So to me, that's where the win-win comes in just by, again, high-speed rail and 5G internet would be the two biggest components of that. You mentioned the readiness of a student upon graduation of high school. Is there any specific elements that you would uh, adjust to, to uh, make sure that students are more prepared when they graduate to meet the world, to change the world? You know, I, I think one of the big things to me would to make sh would be to make sure that all kids are dreamers. I think that all problems. I'm a big dreamer. Uh, my parents really, uh, you know, I used to listen to their stories. You know, I, you probably read on my website. I was adopted. My parents are much older, and I used to love hearing my dad tell stories about his experiences in the Air Force. My mom, when she, I, I, used, I thought it was so amazing that she lived in New York City in the Bronx by herself in the '60s, and so. And, and when I was little, they bought encyclopedias. Uh, a teacher told my mom, my mom asked her, well, what, you know, what should I be doing over the summer? And the teacher told her to read. So my mom got me a library card and made me go to the library and check out stacks of books. So to me, it instilled a dream in me that, that there was a reality, a world that was outside of what I could see. And when I think about kids today, I don't think that our kids are dreaming enough. So when I think about what we can do from a, a, a uh, you know, from the adult population it is, how do we prepare our kids to go into the workforce? We prepare them by allowing them to dream that it's not our dream that they're trying to pursue. It's their dream of trying to pursue and encouraging them to, what is it that you, excuse me again, where do you want to start your life out? What, did, what is it that you enjoy doing? And to help put them on that track. Now, it may change over time, but it gets them started. It gets them into the workforce. It gets them started in life. And so to me, if, if you want to talk about one very big thing. It is dreaming for for our youth. Okay. Um, a couple more things I want to get to before the end of the show. I, I do recall reading that you said that the government does not determine what is moral or immoral. Was that a good question? And did I phrase that the right way? And could you expound on it if I did ask the question the yeah, right way, sir? You did. Um, so what I would say, you know, grew, growing up in Lexington, it was a dry county. So couldn't sell alcohol there. Well, people would just go to Salisbury, buy alcohol and bring it to Lexington and sell it. It was bootlegging. Um, and so that kind of taught me that that government can determine what is legal and illegal, but they can't tell someone what is moral and immoral. A person would determine their own morality standards, their own moral standards. And I think one of the problems that we're seeing in our society today, and I would kind of look at it as we have three pillars in our society. We have government, we have our, uh, uh, religious and non-religious communities, and then we have business. And I think the problem that we run into is that each one is trying to do a job that it's not capable of doing. So whereas government can determine 
what is legal and illegal. It can't determine what's moral and immoral. The church, well, especially church and even our all of our institutions, our religious and non-religious communities can help people find that purpose and that moral standard that they need to establish so that and, and purpose for their lives because government can't do that and we can pass every program known to man and it's still a, if a person doesn't have a purpose for using it they won't use it and so we really depend like i said on government doing this job of protecting rights and investing uh, in, but not trying to determine morality it's our religious and non-religious institutions that that's where the the charge lies is that that's where that's where our morality and our standards have to come from. And then from a business perspective, that's the means to our dreams. That business is, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that there's no morality in government or in business, but I am saying that the moral standards that we have to live by or should live by have to come from something outside of government or outside of business, because neither one of those are capable of determining what is right and you know what is moral, because if one person decides uh, and I would say from my own moral perspective, um, I consider I, I would have considered myself an evangelical Christian. Uh, I still would, some may not, but I consider myself to be an evangelical Christian. And so I really um, believe that the word of God is true. And I really, for my own personal life, take a very conservative view of my faith. But I also realize how dangerous that would be to impose that on someone else. Because as soon as I impose it on someone else, it doesn't, it's not legal or illegal, excuse me, it's not moral or Im immoral anymore, it's legal or illegal. And so now we're going to have a fight, we're going to have arguments, which we've again been doing for the last 50 years. So hopefully I've answered the question that, I, I just think that government cannot determine morality, but that charge lies at our religious and non-religious institutions to do that. Okay, since we have a moment here before I ask, the, the biggest question I want to ask going out of the show is what do you consider your strong, your strength? What do you consider your strength and what you want people to know you by? But before we get to that, since we have a moment, if you will be so much to share with us about your profile, introduce yourself. You know, you mentioned where you were from um, and, and tell us, you know, why you feel like you're the candidate for this position. But, uh, who are you? <laughs> so again, yeah, my name is James Carr. I'm originally from Lexington, North Carolina, where I was adopted by my parents, James and Virginia Carr. Um, and it was a unique experience because it was like being raised by grandparents. Uh, they were definitely strict, <laughs> uh, okay. but but they were also my biggest supporters. And you know, one of the things that I had an issue with growing up was not that they loved me, but I could never really wrap my mind around why they loved me. And and you know, and we had a great relationship. You know, I feel blessed to that they were my parents. But I could, it was hard for me to wrap my head around that fact. And when it finally dawned on me that they love me, just because we had the capacity to love. And and once I could really embrace that, it really helped me to understand even how they looked at other people. And they were always, if someone needed help, my parents would help them. My parents, now they were definitely feisty. We'll say. Uh, I, I'm nothing like them in terms of personality. They were definitely much more confrontational than I am. But the one thing was that within that confrontation, if you needed something, they were there for you. They were very passionate about how they lived their lives. And, and, you, and, and so they really instilled in me that the confidence to go for things in life. Uh, just a little, I remember my dad, um, his boss's uh, his wife asked him to do something. My dad did it his boss cussed him out and my dad was not the person that you cuss out. So, but he said what he had to say. And then he went and got another job. And then the man came down and talked to my mom and said, well, when he comes down, tell him he still works for me. Tell him he still had the job. And so <laughs> my dad went back, but that really helped me to understand that he was able to do that because he believed in himself. He was able to do that because he knew how he, he knew he was a good worker. He knew, what his skills were. He knew that he could go get another opportunity if he needed to get another opportunity. So that really instilled in me to, to go out and pursue life and have fun with life and don't be afraid to take chances. And so when it came time for me to make a decision in life, I wanted to go to the Air Force. They were mad. They wanted me to go to college, but I wanted to pursue the Air Force. And I went to college, um, got my accounting degree, uh, became a CPA. Like that, I always loved IT a lot more. Uh, 
look for projects to help me develop the skills I needed to transition. And I got into IT. And, um, and so that to, to me, just enjoying life, going for life, and knowing that people will always, there's always somebody who's going to help you. If you are putting the effort in life, I truly believe that you'll just run across people that are just going to help you. And I've been helped by so many people in my life that um, I, I, I see that that's the, the true blessing. So if you want to know anything about James Carr, it is that I trust people, I believe in people, and um, I have no problem doing the things that I think are in the interest of people. Ladies and gentlemen, James L. Carr Jr. running for U.S. Senate. What is your strength? What is it you you want to us to know about your message today? And why think, do you feel strong enough to lead? Okay. I, I think the, the one thing that you should know about me today is that I believe in people. That I believe that people, everyone is capable of living out their dreams and their passions, aspirations, and that you simply doing that is the greatest blessing that you could give anybody. You being the best version of yourself is the greatest blessing. And I will fight to pass legislation that does just that. What is what makes you the best candidate for this position? I think understanding being around people. I think when you look at our current and this is not a knock on anyone running for office, everyone is trying is, is there to try to make a difference. But I think if you kind of look at the breakdown, it's broken down with lawyers. Uh, career politicians, small business owners, and CEOs. Now, those are all great professions, but the problem is that they don't interact with people. And so when you you kind of see when, when legislation is being discussed, they're talking about, well, here's the good guy and here's the bad guy, or here's the here's this person that I don't have a, a, a feel for a relationship with. That I, So when I'm arguing legislation, I can't really see the person that I'm talking about. And I can see that. I can my work experience, I have worked with, if, if there's somebody in America that you don't like, a group that you don't like, I've worked with them. So I, I worked in furniture factories. I worked at uh, ice cream manufacturer. I worked in the department store, fast food, military, um, check printing company. So it, it's interesting to me that I've met, the, I've truly met the melting pot of America. And we haven't always seen eye to eye, but we always we were always able to work together. You know, if you go in the military, you know, I would tell anyone, if you think that, you know, think about the military had to integrate black women, uh, members of the LGBT, LGBT community, and the military worked. And that's just in modern history, let alone in the past, it had to integrate, you know, we look at the 13 colony, those were 13 different countries that the military integrated. And so it works in the military and it works because people are around each other. I think our current political system, why I'm the best candidate, is because I have a fee I understand people because I'm around people. I know that no matter what we may argue about, at the end of the day, you're still an American, you still have rights, and you still deserve to be heard. Are there any other areas uh, during your campaign that uh, you would like to invite us to, to follow you, um, in a particular social media, in a particular special aspect you would like us to learn more about you. Yeah, so please, uh, my website, carljuniorforsenate.com, and it has all my social media links for you to follow. I also have another link that may not be on the screen here, but another link is uh, on my website is a section called Meet and Greet, where I'm inviting others to come and, and sign up to have a discussion with me. It's basically what this scenario is, where we set up a, a Zoom call and we just talk and you know whatever issues you have whatever questions you have i'm free to to i can answer those questions or address those issues so that to me is i want to hear from people because i know that no no one has all the answers but i also think not even having all the answers but i think sometimes we need to hear the voice of people to actually put a face behind an issue and that's what these meeting greets are an opportunity to do outstanding in a way for people to get engaged in the government, to get right. engaged in city and county government. What what suggestions would you have? Because you seem to be a very, or you are a very interpersonal candidate. It seems that you want to represent uh, the citizen and show them what government really is on the human side. So mm -hmm. how would you, go ahead, I'm listening. Oh, well, I would just say, look at me as an example. You know, I still work a job. 
I'm out here running for the Senate. It's it's not hard to run for public office and it's not hard to have your voice in public office. Um, and I, hopefully this will be a motivation to anyone that sees that, you know what, I can make a difference. I can get involved in my community. I can get involved and I can make the world a better place. And there, again, there's no way of making the world a better place than to be the best version of yourself. And whatever that dream or passion or goal that you have is to get involved in that. And also from, from the political arena is if you're not going to run for office, at least vote, at least get out and make your voice heard. Because if you don't make your voice heard, one of the things that we're seeing with gerrymandering and voting rights restrictions is the belief that people don't care. That, that's really what undermine, underlies that argument is that we can restrict the rights of people to vote and they won't care. And I think if you want to, it, we have to prove that our voice is worth being heard. And we prove that by voting and getting involved in our communities. Outstanding. What a way to address those voting issues. I <laughs> like the transition. It was great. <laughs> the U.S. Supreme Court has made some decisions concerning North Carolina just recently. Right. And I know you are uh, excited about that, I would think. Yes. And, uh, so your forecast for this election, uh, the time, when do we vote? How mm -hmm. do people, you know, uh, support you from here? Is there any right. things that you want to share about your campaign and how people can get in touch or support you? I think the big thing is uh, uh, follow me on social media. And, and of course, the big thing really is donations. <laughs> uh, please give to the campaign. If, you know, uh, I think that this is something special that we can do as, as a group because I can't win this election without people. Um, and this is not a knock on the, on, the, on the, you know, the political parties. I am a proud Democrat, um, but my candidacy is completely different. I need people. I need people to, to voice their support through social media, through um, through donations, and by coming out to, to support at the different activities that we're going to have, and also again for the meeting greets to just come out, and you know we're going to be posting those clips, and I've heard so many great stories and so many personal uh, testimonies that I think that just your individual testimony coming out for the meeting greet, it really makes a difference in how people. Are going to perceive our country and um and yeah that's it <laughs> all right well we have a couple of more moments before we uh, conclude this episode of meet the candidate if you had a final word if you had a final word that you wanted to share with the audience um what would it be i would say that i know i'm asking a lot i'm asking you to believe in me I know that I'm a, I'm perceived to be a political novice, but I, 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 I believe me when I tell you that I have a wealth of work of life experiences that will make me a great candidate, a great representative of the people. I think the main thing to take away is that I will believe I believe in you, I trust in you, and I will do everything in my power to empower you to live out your dreams. And if you walk that journey with me, I promise you, I will not disappoint you. Outstanding. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a wonderful, powerful, informative uh, episode of Meet the Candidate with James L. Carr Jr., who is running for U.S. Senate. And his contact information has been displayed throughout and, and continues to be displayed throughout this interview. Thank you for joining us here today on GPAT 23. Uh, I'm Vernon Garrison, and I have had a pleasure uh, meeting you, sir. Thank you. The same here. I really appreciate this. Yes, indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope to see you soon. Stay tuned for more episodes of Meet the Candidate here on GPAT 23. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And good luck to you and your family in your endeavors to become U.S. Senator. Oh, thank you, sir. You take care and God bless. God bless you. Good day. Thank you.